In his biography of North Dakota's most famous journalist, The American Journey of Eric Severide, author Raymond Schroth chronicles the famous journalist's growth from his boyhood home in Belva, North Dakota, to his two decades as America's most influential news commentator. Funding for this program is provided by the partners of Read North Dakota. Our authors, our stories. I still have his FBI file. It's not a lot of stuff in here, but it's, it's a little wicked uh, when you see how bitter people can be if they, if they have an enemy. A Jesuit priest and professor of journalism, Schroth had no doubt whose life should be the subject of his first biography. I'd watched him every night for my whole life, <laughs> as far as I could recall. Even when we were in the Jesuit seminary, it was during the beginning of the Vietnam War, and we were very interested in current events. Uh, all, the, all the seminarians would go and, and watch CBS Evening News and end with <clears throat> Eric Severide's two-minute commentary at the end. And to us, we got a nickname for him, God. <laughs> Faced with the challenge of writing about the life of a public person who protected his personal privacy, Schroth approached the task in a time-honored tradition. Now, Francis Parkman the great 19th century historian. If he was going to write a battle, he would go to the battlefield. So he went to Velva and stayed there for several days. And I'll tell you, uh, I, I, I knew what it meant to him. But what you, you like to do is uh, experience what he experienced as much as you can. And so I one day, on my last day there, there was a hill of wheat. And I just went out alone and climbed that hill of wheat and got as high as I could and then looked to see as far as I could. And I said to myself, this is what he used to see. And several people who have written about him or talked about him mentioned the impact on his imagination from those vast plains, which would represent the infinite possibility of the American future. In his biography of North Dakota's most famous journalist, author Raymond Schroth explores Eric Severide's life and character, his seminal influence on broadcast journalism, and his legacy as the man whose news commentaries represented a kind of national conscience. Read North Dakota proudly presents an evening with Raymond Schroth. You're very kind. Uh, I've had a, a Franklin Roosevelt, and I think in the 36th campaign, uh, when he was, I, I used to hear records of him that I would play at home. Uh, he was traveling in New England and he had a way of saying he, how glad he was to be somewhere and he'd say, <clears throat> I've had a glorious day here in New England. Now I can't really do that, uh, uh, but I've had a glorious couple of days here in North Dakota and I'm very grateful to all of you for making me so happy uh, and feel much at home, uh, particularly the Council on the Humanities and Brenda Doherty and Prairie Public uh, Radio and TV, uh, Kim Stenden and other people who have been so kind to me. Uh, I, I'm not used to this. I walk along the street and people look at me and, and smile and say hello. And when I try to cross the street, not at a light, cars will stop and let, let me go. Jersey City does not do this. <laughs> We've come together this evening, and I'm convinced, not merely out of a nostalgic affection for bygone days, when the major networks did courageous documentaries, and when radio and television newscasters respected the English language and public intelligence, nor even for love of North Dakota, nor merely out of respect for the legacy 
of Eric Severide. I think we come in patriotism because, like Severide, we love America. Its wheat fields and local rivers, its trout streams and ocean shores, its Belvas and Manhattans, and even its Washington, D.C. And though your children and grandchildren and my journalism students might not recognize the name, we miss him. We think we know what he would say if he was here today. In the summer of 1994, I was swimming in the surf off Seabright at the Villa House of the Society of Jesus on the New Jersey shore. And a fellow Jesuit asked me what I was working on. And I said, I doing a biography of Eric Severide. And he heard this, he replied, as the waves washed around him, there comes a time when the heart must tell the head what it must do. And that is the time when the heart is about to break. My friend was quoting the last line of Eric's powerful CBS Evening News commentary on the Vietnam War. He had heard it once and remembered it for 20 years. Meanwhile, today, when synchronized suicide bombings of government buildings in Baghdad kill more than 130 Iraqis, and when two helicopter crashes in Afghanistan take another 14 American lives, well, President Obama takes his time deciding on troop deployments there because he wants to do it right. The battle between the human head and the heart seems relevant again. Although television brought Severide's solemn, handsome, nervous face into 12 million American living rooms for 15 years, and the full head of gray hair and high cheekbones earned him nicknames like Eric Everwise and Zeus and God, TV was not his natural medium, and he was never really comfortable in it. I first discovered him when I was a 17-year-old college freshman at Fordham in 1951, and our Jesuit supervisors made us turn our lights out and go to bed at 11 p.m. I got in bed, but I kept my radio tuned to CBS 11 o'clock news when Eric had a nightly five-minute commentary at the end. I particularly remember an analysis of Harold Stassen, whose only athletic prowess, said Severide, was rifle marksmanship, which is basically cold competition against one's self. About Stassen, I knew only that he ran off in, for the presidency. But I had found in this commentator a man I could admire. I already came from a journalism family, but from then on, I looked for occasions as a student journalist in Paris and at Fordham in the Bronx and as a traveler in Vietnam, as a reader and writer, when my life could be more like his. In the first beautiful paragraph of his post-World War II memoir, Not So Wild a Dream, Written miraculously in eight months, he evokes the earth, fields, and waters of tiny Velva, where he was born, to set the scene for the book's theme, the democratic spirit that won the war took its strength from the American frontier, from the toil and vision of the men and women who came together to build the barns and harvest the crops, and then to fight the battles of the war. He begins, the small brown river curved around the edge of our town. The farmers plowed close to its muddy willows, and there's not much shade in the northern sections of Dakota. 
nor is there much shelter in the wintertime. Even as very small children, we could sense the river's life-giving nature and its meaning to the farmers and to us all. Because their father was the banker, although their home was both large enough to hold his older brother Paul and his younger brother John and his sister Jean, and small enough for the tall Arnold, his real name, when in 1939 he moved his middle name, Eric, up in the front place, tall enough then to hit his head on the ceiling as he grew. But these were the town gentry. The Severide boys had bikes before the other boys did. In 1918, the flu almost killed his mother and it laid Arnold low for six weeks during his first grade. But he was already a lean, handsome boy with a rugged face in photographs that made him look older by several years. Though Velva inspired his prose, once he left, he returned there only three times. In the summer of 1933, he stopped off looking like a vagrant when he was hopping freight trains to take him for a job in a California gold mine. He later wrote that he had hoped to pop back in town in a white chauffeured limousine and a cloud of dust, stop at the pharmacy and buy a hundred ice cream cones and give them all to the boys and girls. In 1953, he wrote a letter supporting a fund drive for a Velva medical clinic. And in 1956, he published You Can Go Home Again in Collier's Magazine, uh, an ambiguous essay which could be read as an endorsement or as an indictment of American small town life. He had consulted a psychiatrist about his boyhood memories and had been told that his emotional attraction for the Mouse River was the so-called an oceanic feeling, a deep yearning for ultimate origins, the golden threads of the past. Exploring the town alone, he knocks at the door of his old house. No one answers. In 1987, just five years before his death, with his sister Jean and a PBS television crew, he returned to produce an American Experience documentary on the early chapters of Not So Wild a Dream. The project took three days, but he stayed in a hotel in Minot and commuted to work. Arthritic, he moved slowly with a cane. The visuals show the wheat fields and the Mouse River of the first line of his memoir. But because the flood control levee had cut off the main current, the river had become a stagnant pond. The script began with a line lifted from his 1946 memoir, Why Have I Not Returned for So Many Years? But a few years earlier, after his Collier's article, a woman came up and told him that I'm from Minot, which he had described as a magic city in his writings. His reply was with a chilly brusqueness, which friends attributed to his shyness and others to his rudeness. I really don't have anything to do with Minot or Velva anymore, he said. We moved to Minnesota when I was very young. I've never been back there except for a couple of special occasions. Oh. To the literary historian, though, there is nothing surprising in his attitude. There is a moment in his childhood where the very young Arnold symbolically runs away from home. He zips out the door and runs down the street He's headed for several blocks to who knows where. Anyone from a small town 
who wants to be a writer, Willa Cather, Sinclair Lewis, Larry Warbody, must first flee the town. Otherwise, he or she risks the self-censorship to avoid offending relatives or the local history syndrome that tends to romanticize the past. But it was here, as an apprentice at the Velvet Journal, a four-page weekly, that he learned what he wanted to do with his life. When his father's bank failed in 1925, family moved for a year to Minot and then to Minneapolis, where he lived in a big wooden house in a middle-class neighborhood. And though the high school period, he wrote, is surely the worst period in a man's life, at Minneapolis Central High School, he learned something about cooperation, team spirit, social equality, how to put the school paper to press, and how to write a two-column headline, which, he said, was on a much higher order than the ability to write a sonnet. When I was doing my research, I followed young Arnold's trail from Velva to Minnesota. I stayed a few days at the Jesuit novitiate residence in St. Paul, where one of the young Jesuits, when I said what I was working on, exclaimed, oh, I know about him. Uh, just today, uh, I met a guy whose father made a big canoe trip with him in 1930. Not in my wildest dreams had I imagined that I could actually find and talk to Walter Port, the rugged young athlete, much more than three years older than Eric, who joined him for the 2,250-mile death-defying ordeal of paddling a canoe from Minneapolis to the Hudson Bay. When I found Walter, Walter Port the next day, he was extremely gracious, but ailing and failing. He out, had outlived his old friend, but just barely. I sensed that had it not been for Walter Port's strong body and strength of character 65 years before, there would have been no Eric Severide as we have come to know him. At the turning point of their journey, they were urged to turn back. But, Eric wrote later, what I was entering upon at Norway House was a contest with myself. I knew instinctively that if I gave up now, no matter what the justification, it would become easier forever afterwards to justify compromise with any achievement. At the University of Minnesota, he was the rare undergraduate who published his first book at 18, Canoeing with the Cree, 1935, based on the reports he had sent to a local newspaper on his trip. And today, bold young men and women, every few years, reproduce the journey, feeding the Minneapolis Tribune from their laptops along the route. <clears throat> Working his way through college, he majored in political science and joined the Jacobins, an elite political discussion group mentored by the charismatic professor Benjamin Lippicott a well-known social democrat, or democratic socialist sounds better. Several were pacifists, and they demonstrated against the compulsory drill. More than anything else, Eric poured his energies into the campus Minnesota Daily, convinced that he should and would be named editor, only to have his name vetoed by the university president. The sting of this rebuke still lingers 10 years later in his memoirs. And 10 years after that, in the 1950s, 
his opposition to the ROTC pops up again in his FBI file as evidence that he was un-American. Nevertheless, his career maintains the steady course into newspaper journalism at the Minneapolis Star and the Minneapolis Journal, where he covered the brutal a trucker strike and exposed a group called the Silver Shirts, a national network of Ku Klux Klan-like clubs, only to be fired in the wake of the newspaper strike. In 1935, he had married Louis Finger, a law student and the beautiful and brilliant daughter of the track coach. In 1937, they left for a new life in Paris. There, the Paris edition of the New York Herald Tribune saw his talent, and they let him write whatever he wanted. He interviewed Gertrude Stein, and his coverage of the trial of Eugene Weidman, a famous serial killer, caught the eye of CBS's Edward R. Murrow, who was over in London. War was on the horizon, and Murrow had been commissioned to assemble a cadre of reporters to cover it. His search was not for young men with good looks. Radio listeners neither knew nor cared about whether or not their reporters were handsome, nor even great voices. What mattered was intelligence and the ability to adapt the language to, of print journalism to the needs of the ear. Realism, to make the listener feel present at the event like they'd hold the microphone at the pavement level so listeners could hear the footsteps of the Lunders descending into the bomb shelters during the raids. And to teach them conviction that the common man, given the information, can judge what the public needs. Severi, by nature, spoke and wrote visually, but somehow he made his poetic prose work. He joined the new fraternity called Murrow's Boys with William L. Shirer, Larry Lasseur, Howard K. Smith, Winston Burdett, and Charles Collingwood, with Murrow as not just their boss, but especially for Eric, a father figure, and in London, their inspirational leader, like Shakespeare's, we saw the film, I'm sure, Henry V, their little touch of Harry in the night. As the German army marched toward Paris, Eric sent Lois and their twin sons, Michael and Peter, delivered after a very difficult pregnancy, home to America. Eric had come to love Paris passionately, it was the city that gave this North Dakota and Minnesota boy a new life. As his government fled south, he wrote, Paris lay inert, her breathing scarcely audible, her limbs relaxed, the blood flowed remorselessly from her manifold veins. Paris lay dying like a beautiful woman in a coma, not knowing or asking why. This was another turning point. <clears throat> like his pause at the age of that 17 on the way to the Hudson Bay, as a teenager, <clears throat> he had identified with Richard Harding Davis, the greatest turn-of-the-century war correspondent, whose stories of the battles had the unfortunate effect not only of making war look romantic, but in the Spanish-American War and the Boer War, or some, the, the, giving the idea that uh, correspondents were somehow invulnerable, that the bullets passed over their heads or hit only combatants on either sides of the intrepid reporter. 
Davis himself discovered to his shock in his attempts to cover World War I that the machine gun and bombing from the air had made all the old gentleman rules of wars obsolete. In World War II, many correspondents would lose their lives. Severide did not want to be one of them. He was afraid. But he was also learning that fear is never conquered in one brave act. Like the lifelong struggle for personal integrity, it is conquered only step by step, minute by minute, and for him, word by word. At this turning point, I'd like to condense the chronology a bit of Zebrai's life and focus on one aspect of his character, which to me, at least, seems, in retrospect, the most meaningful. Rather than return to America to be with his family, Eric reported to Murrow in London. But his nerves did not serve him well during the Blitz. Murrow himself, whose spectacular courage led him to fly with the bombing raids over Germany, refused to go into the shelters because he said that once he tried one, he might flee to them all the time. Severide returned to Washington in 1941 and covered stories in Latin America, but his eyes were on Europe. Though the terms objective journalism was not yet current, Severide, like Murrow, believed that the media must serve democracy and so should be mobilizing public opinion against Nazi Germany. When the bombs fell on Pearl Harbor, he struggled with his conscience over whether he should enlist. But he was persuaded to serve as a war correspondent instead. He followed the armies into China, North Africa, Italy, southern France, and finally across the Rhine into Germany. After the war, the Murrow boys became foreign radio and then television correspondents for CBS, known as the Tiffany Network for its high standards and courageous documentaries like CBS reports. With Severide as a roving correspondent and nightly commentator with the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. As his professional life soared, his personal life was falling apart. Lois was a manic depressive and frequently hospitalized. Eric was attentive and tried to be loyal, but he had limited emotional energy. Most people who know him well agree that Eric was a man of great integrity. Yet, there is evidence that this shyness of his was another word for being self-centered. That as a child of the Depression whose father's bank had failed, he was obsessed with not having much money and that he did not show enough affection to his sons. In the long run, he didn't have the emotional energy to cope with the behavior of his bipolar wife. Howard K. Smith told me in Eric's defense, that Eric was a man with a strong need for affection, and he wasn't getting it, and he had a right to a happier life. Eric himself considered his behavior morally indefensible. Dan Rather told me it remained an ob object of excruciating guilt for him for the rest of his life. In 1959, they moved to Georgetown, and then he abandoned Lois and fled to Spain, and then London and New York with Pauline Marshall, a vivacious daughter of a Cuban-born opera singer, a young woman half his age, who was herself a songwriter and singer. 
He divorced Lois in 1962, married Moline in 1963, and they had one child, Christina. But their worlds did not mesh. On Saturday nights, Eric liked to stay home and read. Belene wanted to go out and party. They divorced in 1973. Lois, who attained some peace through medication, had died in 1970. If Eric Severi did not have the emotional strength for, in sickness and in health, marital fidelity, what was the heart of his moral character? I suggest physical and moral courage. He planted the building blocks of this courage as a high school graduate by canoeing to Hudson Bay and as a college student by riding the rails during the Depression across the country to work in a California gold mine. During World War II, he did not want to die, but he continually put himself in circumstances where he might be killed. In 1943, at the request of the United States government, he flew to China to assess the political situation. Over the Burma hump, the engines of his C-46 gave out, and the 20 passengers, including diplomat John Patton Davies, parachuted into the jungle. At the realization that the plane was going to crash, Eric's first reaction was, oh no, this can't happen to me. But as his chute opened, it was, my God, I'm going to live. As a boy, he received the sacrament of confirmation and considered joining the Lutheran ministry. But in college, and in his journalism career, he left religion behind. But as the wind carried his chute toward the burning wreckage of the plane, he prayed, Dear God, don't let the fire get me, please. As the survivors assembled, the captain appointed Eric group chaplain. Not because he was holy, because he was older and he looked like a leader. <laughs> In a way that foreshadowed the role that he would assume as a TV commentator, Chaplain Eric was playing a role which, though secular, stemmed from his professionalism as a newsman, one who gets the story and considers its meaning, which is, in a sense, his quest for transcendent truth. So, on August 8, 1943, in the jungle, at 11 a.m., the time he remembered going to church at home, he constructed a huge cross and conducted a memorial service for the co-pilot, Lieutenant Charles Felix, whose body they had buried on the hillside. The Nagas, fierce headhunters, found them and made them at home. They made them at home. The Air Force dropped supplies. Days later, a rescue party led by a dashing young British diplomat arrived to help guide them on a 140-mile, 10-day march during which Eric, at one time, lost control, turned green, and collapsed with exhaustion as they trudged over hills and waterfalls under the boiling sun into safety in India. He continued his mission to China, where he traveled extensively, met the troops and their leaders, and broadcast several reports which he could get through the censors. But the 2,500-word 2, essay in which he delivered the full negative assessment of the Shanghai Shek regime, whose government was more fascist than democratic, and concluded that if the Chinese and American people were to remain friends, we must end the polite lying and false propaganda and the concealing of their faults. This report was killed by government censors 
and shelved. In 1954, John Patton Davies was fired from the State Department and giving, for giving advice that later turned out to be unpopular, but true. With the rise of Senator Joseph R. McCarthy, Democrats were accused of having lost China. And John Foster Dulles removed Davies and others known as the old China hands, accusing them of being soft on communism from the Foreign Service. Eric, in his late night radio broadcast, knowing that he himself could be accused of communist sympathies if his 1943 essay was dug up and publicized, nevertheless defended him. The board had dismissed Davies. <clears throat> the, 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 the charge of communism, they, they dismissed that charge, but said that he had, quote, defects of character. Several I recalled their ordeal in the Burma jungles and replied, I saw their victim measured against the most severe tests that mortal man can design, those he passed at the head of the class. Herbert Bayard Swope, the legendary editor of the old New York World, praised Severide's courage. Davies responded that, yes, it did take courage to against, go against the historical frame of mind in the country. But in another sense, it did not take courage because Severide really believed what he said. And it was his business to say what he believed. From the beginning in 1950, well before Merrow's famous See It Now broadcast, Severides opposed McCarthyism and defended others like Owen Lattimore and Robert Oppenheimer, who he thought were falsely accused. His toughest condemnation came during the Army McCarthy hearings on January 10th, 1954 when McCarthy revealed that a young man on the staff of counsel Joseph Welsh had a remote communist connection. And Welsh exploded in righteous indignation. Have you no shame, Senator? Severide replied that night that McCarthy had no answer because, quote, he had no feeling that he had done anything morally wrong. He cannot help it. The personal tragedy of McCarthy is that the nerve cord or cluster of cells that produced what men call conscience was not granted to him. <laughs> From 1963 until he retired in 1977, Eric Severide settled into a working routine. He interrupted only for occasional speaking engagements, fishing trips, and vacations. He drove his daughter, Tina, to Chevy Chase Elementary School, read the New York Times and Washington Post, and then drove his blue Volvo to the new CBS office at 2020 M Street at 10 a.m., where in his relatively large office, he sat and stared at his gray manual royal typewriter. After lunch, he answered all his correspondence. And unless the, red, the writer questioned his integrity, he sent warm, brief, gracious replies. To old friends from Velva, he wrote, of course I remember you. Your house was just right, across the street, right? He wrote many condolence notes, often promising prayers. The challenge was writing that evening's commentary. Strictly speaking, in journalism, conventional wisdom, it was not a commentary, but an analysis. An editorial 
promises a line of action. An analysis dissects a news item into its parts and puts it in context. A commentary gives the journalist's personal opinion. Severide was not supposed to give opinions. Whatever the form, the attraction for Severide's viewers was watching a good mind come to a conclusion, a clear opinion that will help move a public trying to make up its mind. His creative process was complex. For yet some years, he talked out ideas with producer friends. He made phone calls, picked the brains of local experts, wandered into the hall and paced solemnly up and down, stopped in with the young Marvin Kalb, just back from Moscow. He lunched with friends who complained that he mumbled. He swam in the Metropolitan Club to ease the pain of his arthritis. Then he returned to the office where he'd sometimes stretch out on the sofa. Then he returned to the typewriter and stare some more. <laughs> he smoked steadily, inhaling deeply and then blowing a big cloud out in front of his face. Some staff complained he was lazy. After all, how hard is it to write 400 words, a two-minute address? But for him, it was not just 400 words. They were his 400 best words. Words meant to last. He told novelist Kurt Vonnegut that he was writing the Gettysburg Address every day. Finally, the script was retyped for the teleprompter the makeup was applied, the lights dimmed because he hated the glare, and to soften his features. He never got used to microphones or cameras, and he long complained that the TV medium sacrificed words to image. And he was so nervous that he averaged he would swallow nine times in every two minutes. He used to have a pool as to how many times he was going to go gulp before he got to the end. <laughs> Yet, on ironi ironically, on nights when his viewers had no idea what exactly he had said, they were still awestruck by that large, green-filling gray head from which the words poured forth and they belonged to such a very wise and good man. When Eric Severide retired in 1977, he was never replaced. And in the silence that followed for a number of reasons, economical, political, and personal, the art of commentary died. Once 60 Minutes demonstrated that news could be profitable as well as a source of network prestige, management evaluated news programs on the basis of the bottom line. Those two minutes could be used for another commercial. When the new technology made it possible to broadcast live from over the, all over the world, young, ambitious reporters lusted after those two minutes as well. Commentary had developed during the New Deal years when big new government programs demanded experts like Walter Lippmann and James Reston, the Alsop brothers, to explain these policies. Today, cabinet members and even the president compete for time on the Sunday morning and even late night talk shows. With the explosion of information, the line between reporting and interpretation has grown fuzzy again. The journalist on the scene interprets the event. In public television sometimes and cable news, pundits who, unlike their journalistic predecessors, who were made experts by their experience, pundits are often former political operatives who either just chat sort of seriously when they haven't prepared, or yell at one another and call an analysis. 
Last fall, the conservative group in Arlington, Virginia, the Allied Leadership Institute, gave courses to 600 people in punditry, including a three-hour, $1,500 one-on-one session where they learned to wear charcoal gray suits and white shirts, to smile a lot, use short slogans like flip-flop, and avoid tough questions by saying, now look, the real question is something over there, right? Oh, over there. <laughs> Finally, Eric was correct when he feel, feared that the picture would win out over the good word. In the world of the couch potato with the remote control, no one will listen to one person for two whole minutes. Uniquely, the problem is, uh, ultimately, the problem is that Severide was unique. No one else has come along with the world's battlegrounds, his literary history and literature, and his mastery of the language, as well as the North Dakota wheat fields in his blood and brains. He was all of America talking in dialogue with itself. In three quotations, I'd like to give him the last words. In October 1970, in a speech written by William Sapphire, Vice President Spiro Agnew, in an attempt to intimidate the press, said that commentators like Howard K. Smith and Eric Severide should appear on a panel show and be forced to reveal their real opinions. Severide replied. Finally, at the risk of sounding a bit stuffy, we may say two things. One, that nobody in this business expects for a moment that the full truth of anything will be contained in any one account or commentary, but that through free reporting and discussion, as Mr. Walter Lippmann put it, the truth will emerge. And second, that the central point about the free press is not that it be accurate, though it must try to be, not that it be fair, though it must try to be that, but that it be free. And that means, in the first instance, freedom from any and all attempts by any power of government to coerce it or intimidate it in any way. On April 19, 1972, the futility of the Vietnam War was becoming evident. Eric said, if we have reached the dreadful point where the honor of the state and the conscience of the people collide, then what does honor mean anymore? We are asked to believe that it is dishonorable to depart and risk the safety of the Vietnam political and military leaders but honorable to go on contributing to the certain death and misery of those who are wholly innocent. We are asked to believe that better relations with Russia are worth the loss of our own sense of moral identity. There does come a time when the heart must rule the head. That time is when the heart is about to break. On November, in November 18th through the 20th, 1977, he was given three nights to say goodbye. On the last, he said, there is in the American people a tough, undiminished instinct for what is fair. Rightly or wrongly, I have the feeling that I have passed that test. I shall wear this like a medal. Millions have listened intently and indifferently, in agreement and in powerful disagreement. 
Tens of thousands have written their thoughts to me. I will feel always that I stand in their midst. This was Eric Severide in Washington. Thank you and goodbye. I say amen. <laughs>